Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This is a really important topic to us, so we appreciate your attendance. I'm Taylor Snook. I'm here with my colleague, Joanne. Hi. Uh, we're from Perkins Access, which is a division of Perkins School for the Blind, located just down the river in Watertown. Um, I've put our Twitter handle on the screen. It's per at Perkins underscore access. Um, it'll also be on all the slides, and I encourage you to send any questions that pop into your mind throughout the presentation um, to our uh, Twitter account. So one in seven, that is a very conservative estimate of the number of people worldwide that have a disability. So that's about 15 to 20 percent of the popula population. Um, and it's important to remember that many dis disabilities are not visible. People around you all the time have disabilities and you may not realize it. We group disabilities into four key categories, including visual, which can, can includes blindness, low vision, um, things like cataracts, glaucoma, auditory disabilities, which include deafness, hard of hearing, um, deaf blindness obviously spans the visual and auditory categories, cognitive impairments, so that can be learning disabilities, dyslexia, attention disorders, um, as well as people with memory impairments. Um, and then motor, um, motor disability, so that could be paralysis, partial paralysis, um, you know, limited use of your hands, arthritis or chronic pain, muscular dystrophy. Um, so all these people um, use different strategies to access digital technology. Uh, with blindness, typically um, people use screen readers, which is what jo uh, Joanne's going to demonstrate. Uh, people also use, rely on keyboards and switch controls. So there's a variety of assistive technologies out there um, that empower these people to um, access digital content. So with that, I'm going to switch it over. And turn off your mouse. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, not yet. Not until I get the browser up. We have the screen yes, slash, slash yep. www .com slash heading level one link graph. Good morning, everybody. I decided I'm going to take you on a journey with me this morning. Now, first off, I am blind, so I do use a screen reader for my PC. I use JAWS, and for my iPhone, I use VoiceOver. And the thing to keep in mind about a screen reader it solely depends on keyboard use. I do not use a mouse. And so this website that I'm visiting today is not unique. I like to travel. And I have visited numerous travel websites. And I haven't been very successful using them. So somebody recommended to me, why don't you go to TripAdvisor? And I thought, you know, that is amazing. I've never done that. And I would, love to, I would love to read reviews. And this is a website I want to try out and see what the experience is like. So this is not unique to TripAdvisor, but this will give you the sense of what this is like to try to look for a flight. I want to go to Singapore after Christmas. So this is a real life experience that I want to have finding my own flight and making my own reservation. So the focus, I'm able to use keyboard navigation quick keys that will give me information such as the title of the page. So if I want to know where the focus is. Title is TripAdvisor, read reviews, compare prices, and put Google Chrome. And that isn't too fast for any of you, is it? Too no. OK, no. great. So I'm able to pull up a list of links. And I'll show you that right now. This feature is only available from within a virtual document, such as a page on the internet. Let's Alt do this. Address TripAdvisor heading level one link graphic. Links list dialog. Links list view. TripAdvisor one of 339. So as you heard, there are 339 links. But I can use first navigation, first letter navigation, get there really quickly. I can also pull up a list of headings. There is currently an open JAWS dialog. Escape. Well, we don't want to do that. There is currently an open JAWS escape. Escape. 
Heading list dialog. Heading to list view. TripAdvisor 1. 1 of 1. Now that's interesting. There's only one heading with all of those links. Hmm, that makes me wonder. And I'm also able to pull up a list of form fields. No form fields were found. Heading to list view. If there were, it would have told me what those form fields were, and that's simply areas where I'm going to edit text. So when I went to TripAdvisor, I thought, well, the first thing I'm going to want to do is sign up. So I use a key command to quickly locate text. So I don't go through all the list of links. Usually I just use a JAWS find command. Ready, ready, Perkins, control F, find, find what edit combo collapsed. Oh, TripAdvisor, read reviews, compare right virtual find, JAWS find dialog, find what? Sing, well, escape, no. virtual find, sign, up, oh, enter, sign up button. Great, so there is a button. Now that's the other thing I can do. I can use B and locate buttons on the page, C for combo boxes, X for X, Box, check boxes. So those are just some of the various ways that I can quickly navigate. So that's B for button. So I'm going to press the space bar. Space. Sign up button. Okay. Space. And? Share your travel sign up button. Nothing happened. Even though it's labeled as a button, I can't activate it. Enter. Let me try enter on that button. Share your travel advice. No? Sign up button. So let me just pull up a list of links and see if I can find flights because I'm obviously not going to be able to sign up. So I just want to point out real quickly that the button did actually work, but Joanne has no way of knowing that because a modal, as you, for those who can see, has appeared on the screen, but focus hasn't moved there and it's positioned in the document uh, object model at the end of all the content. So when she presses tab, instead of going into the modal, she's going to go into um, probably post photos or write a review. In order to get to that modal, which she doesn't even know is there, she would have to tab through all of the content on the page. Um, so that's a critical issue. And the bottom line is, when I'm using my screen reader, what I really want to achieve is success. I want to be independent, and I want to be efficient. And right now, this isn't feeling like it's going to be either. But let's see if I can find flights, even though I can't sign up. Links list dialog, links list view, write review, 10 of 3, F, FD slash F, featuring F, featuring A, F, Fathom, escape. Well, I'll use find again. So, list of GHT, enter. Escape. There are no visited links on this page. Hmm. Now let's open another modal. Ready, ready, Perkins DevOps, Anaheim Hotels link. Okay, we'll try one more time. Virtual find. Jo flights. Enter to compare low prices on hotels, flights and cruises. Put virtual find. Jaw enter. Wrap at the top. Link flights. There we go. Here are flights. Enter. <coughs> Cheap flights from Boston. Ma from dollar seventy six trip advisor. Now I'm going to tab. Page six headings and twenty four links. Now we have six headings, twenty four links. That kind of information is useful. Round trip same page link. One way same page. Multi city same. From where? Edit. Boston Bose. To where? Edit. To where? From graphic heading level one cheap flights from, from where? Edit. To where? Edit. To where? Okay. Enter. Singapore. Enter. Depart to 10 slash 8. Now I don't want to depart on that date, so let's see what I can do. Return to 10 slash 15. Depart to 10 slash 8. Now enter. There's edit Singapore is applicable. Oh, these are the frickin' clickables. So, <laughs> these are all over the place. More frickables than you can ever imagine hearing on one page. So, this frickin' clickable is telling me to click, but there's nothing I can do with that clickable. So, I can't enter where the date is that I want to actually depart. Depart clickable, enter. Clickable, depart clickable. Again, clickable, clickable. Two, ten slash eight, clickable. Enter. Click, return, click, two, ten, clickable. One person, economy, clickable. So there's no way that I can actually choose the departure and return dates. So 
in essence, I'm unable to plan my trip using TripAdvisor. And again, this is not unique to TripAdvisor. I've been to many travel websites and my experience is very similar. I'm not successful. So the bottom line is we want to make sure that we properly label elements and make it possible for a screen reader user to be able to navigate the web page, to be ac able to access the form fields, fill out the information. And in my case, I want to go to Singapore. So it will happen, <laughs> but not on TripAdvisor. Thank you guys very much. Taylor does have to use a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't turn the mouse on then. Oh. oh I did, but I used the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, you can see that, I mean, that's a very simple task. Like searching flights should be very basic, and that's an, an incredibly frustrating experience. Uh, date pickers in general uh, typically have a lot of barriers. Um, so I wanted to quickly talk about how accessibility benefits users that don't necessarily have a disability or they have what we call a temporary or situational disability. So an example of this might be an arm injury where you suddenly can only use one hand um, or you're a new parent and you're holding a child and you're trying to do something on your laptop or your phone um, and you only have the use of one hand. Um, so really accessibility benefits everyone. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room has used closed captions at some point. That's a form of accessibility that really benefits everyone, particularly if you like watching British television like I do. <laughs> um, so some myths I just talked about, uh, it only benefits a few. A lot of people think accessibility is very expensive, and it can be expensive, but not if you're incorporating it into your process. Um, accessibility does not mean your website or digital properties need to be ugly. Um, and a lot of people think that it's just the developer's job to uh, make things accessible and that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, so I'm going to talk more about that. Um, and people think it's optional, which is not true at all. Um, there's lawsuits constantly um, throughout the United States because it is part of the ADA. The, um, American with Disabilities Act, so you're actually required to have an accessible site. Um, by the end of this year, there will be more than 6,000 lawsuits in the United States, and that number has grown exponentially in, in the last three years. Um, so in terms of the legal requirements, most um, lawsuits reference WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and these are really um, criteria that help you reach, your, reach compliance and check the accessibility of your site. Um, so it was first published in 1999 um, by the W3C right across the river at MIT. Um, it was updated last year. Most of the new criteria have to do with mobile devices. Uh, so it's based on four principles, which are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And there's 78 criteria, but we typically, um, they're broken into three conformance levels and we typically focus on A and AA. Um, so that's, there's 50 criteria within those. Um, cost of a bug fix, this is the same thing as cost of an accessibility barrier. So I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar that the cost of fixing something exponentially increases throughout um, your process. Uh, so that's why we encourage everyone to include accessibility, including reviews at your design stage. Send, like, we review wireframes all the time. We can spot things that are going to be potential barriers and advise you on how um, to implement those before a barrier um, presents itself. Um, so now getting into what your role and responsibility is, because everyone plays a role. Um, so for designers, um, it's really important that you review your color palette and design guide and make sure that you're incorporating accessibility into that. Um, I'm showing an example on the screen of the Perkins uh, color palette. 
Um, it not only includes you know, the actual hex codes, but it provides information on how to use those colors to ensure accessibility. Um, and that means making sure you're not using, uh, you're using colors that have a significant amount of contrast and there's actually a specific ratio required by the W, uh, by WCAG. Um, use, using legible fonts that are scalable. That's critical because people use browser zoom all the time to uh, increase text size. And again, you know, a lot of that comes with responsive, um, responsive modes. Defining a highly visible focus indicator. So uh, while Joanne was demoing this, you were able to sort of follow along where she was because of that outline. So often we see that outline either not meet contrast requirements or be hidden entirely. And in that case, someone who's sighted, who's using a keyboard, cannot navigate your site because they don't know where they are. Um, take advantage of white space. Do your best to align text to the left side of the screen. Um, make interactive elements easy to identify so people can tell where something is gonna be a button or something is a link. Um, and that goes um, to my next point, which is don't rely on color alone to communicate information. A lot of times we see links within paragraph text and the way you're indicating that it's a link is purely on color. So that's not gonna help someone who is um, colorblind. And one out of 12 men in the United States has a form of colorblindness. So also for designers talking about structure and layout, you wanna make sure that you're defining those structures and regions for uh, your developers so that they know how to implement those. I'm showing on the screen a way to annotate your designs or wireframes to indicate what the desired uh, focus order is, what your desired regions are. Um, and also when you're designing headings, which as Joanne demonstrated is critical, making sure that you can, you can provide multiple styles for one heading level. And that's important so that um, content authors don't feel like they have to pick a certain heading level just because they want a certain style. It's important that your headings are nested properly. Um, so, you know, level one comes after, or level two comes after level one, and three comes after uh, level two, and so on. Um, forms, uh, making sure your labels are properly positioned um, and that they're permanently visible. There's a trend to use placeholder text instead of labels, um, and that's an accessibility uh, barrier for a lot of users. So, and there's, you know, tricks you can do for this. You can have placeholder text that when someone interacts with that um, form field then sort of shifts into a, a smaller text, but it's still permanently visible. And then minimize animations and content that's, that play automatically. Um, oops, I won't. Uh, so for content authors, in terms of writing copy, and again, a lot of the things I'm talking about overlap across roles. Um, but for, uh, for people writing copy, it's important to use plain, consistent language and try to break up long text or paragraphs with graphics or convert long paragraphs into lists. This really benefits people with cognitive disabilities. It benefits screen reader users who can navigate by lists. And it also benefits people who maybe English is not their first language. Um, again, I can't say it enough, use headings to summarize um, regions of content and create that sort of table of contents for your page. Using semantic markup, so again, lists, making sure data tables are actually in, in tables because screen reader users can understand tables and navigate them a specific way when they're implemented properly. Um, providing alternative text for all images, and that varies by type. I could literally talk about alternative text for three hours, so I'm not gonna go into that, but I would be gladly to talk about that more. Um, making sure links and buttons communicate their purpose. So an the example I have on the screen is a, from our Perkins Access page, and you can see that we've put a lot of white space, we've simplified the text into the different services we've provided, and we've incorporated decorative um, images um, to make it easier to understand. 
Um, and then the button, oh sorry, the link that's below that says more services. And that is just communicates the purpose better than if you were to just say learn more. Joanne was navigating by links and she heard learn more. What, what the heck does that mean? That could be mean anything. But by, by having it called more services, she understands that exactly where that link is gonna bring her. Um, media, closed captions, audio descriptions, and again, for, when you're writing your form labels, be, you know, make the labels easy to understand, provide specific instructions, and it's so important that when you're using error messages that you're specific and you provide a suggestion on how to fix that error. Um, so developers, if you take away one thing from this talk, I want you to remember to use semantic HTML as much as possible. This is critical to accessibility because they are universally understood by assistive technologies. So when you start coding with divs and spans, screen readers don't treat those as interactive elements. Now there's a bunch of things you can add on to those to make a screen reader realize that it's supposed to be a button or a link. Um, but it's just not necessary. You can co you can still use divs and spans, but don't use them for interactive elements. Use them to style content, and you can style those um, uh, semantic elements as well. So it's it's just not necessary. So I'm showing on the screen someone using uh, a monkey wrench to try to um, screw in a Phillips head screw, and that's sort of how I feel sometimes about um, how things are being coded. There's there's semantic HTML that already does everything you need it to do, um, but we're trying to reinvent the wheel and it's causing so many accessibility barriers. Um, so things you can, um, developers can also do, go through this keyboard checklist. Make sure you're implementing a skip to main content link and that doesn't have to be permanently visible. Basically what you want that to be is when a user first tabs into your page, that link should become revealed, and that lets them skip over the navigation, which is critical. If you can imagine every time you go to a website, you have to tab through everything in the navigation, that's so burdensome um, and can be painful for certain individuals. Um, making sure all your interactive elements receive focus, um, making sure that your focus order matches the visual, visual presentation, which makes it easier for people to follow along. Check for keyboard traps. This could be infinite content loading, um, Twitter feeds, things like that that are on your page. Making sure all your media controls are accessible. Um, YouTube is their, um, their controls are accessible if you're using a YouTube player, but there's a lot of other players out there and it's important to check that. And then of course, um, form controls. Uh, more checks, um, I'm gonna, run through this quickly. Making sure you're using the title attribute to give something un uh, unique title so people can, you know, that was the first thing Joanne heard when she got to that page. And so that helps her understand where exactly she's located in the site. Properly nesting headings, using landmarks, and that's how when you're able, screen readers are able to recognize and, and quickly navigate to different regions. Um, making sure all images have all attributes. Developers should not take on the responsibility of writing alternative text, but they should make sure that it's being implemented. Use buttons and links according to what their purpose is. So buttons should trigger actions, like the pop-up modal. That was great that that was a button, it's just too bad Joanne couldn't actually tell that it did anything. <laughs> but you know, at least they coded it as a button, but really that's you know, not good enough. Um, and links should navigate uh, users to, to new pages or to anchor tags within the same page. Use your lang attribute on your, um, the HTML element. Um, that helps not only how content is read to screen readers, but also if someone's uh, translating a language. And use um, the code validator um, uh, provided on the screen at validator.w3.org. Uh, I don't know what time it is, can you? Okay. Um, so you might not be, um, so quickly I'm gonna talk about quality assurance. Um, 
you have to have accessibility um, built in. Oh, sorry, let me quickly say, make sure that there's a process for users to both provide feedback about your site and access customer support when they're reaching a roadblock. Um, include accessibility in your testing procedures. It's great to use automated tools. I encourage that. Just know that they're only going to surface 20% at best 40% of the issues on your site. And user testing, always incorporate users um, with disabilities into your um, user testing. And then establish a, a clear workflow and timeline for remediating issue, issues. Real quick, purchasing. So um, you might have a limited role in this, but make sure that when you're looking at third-party tools um, or, or any kind of software that you're, you're thinking about accessibility. I've provided a list of, of things to ask both your current vendors and future vendors for. So ask if they have an accessibility statement or a VPAT, which is a voluntary um, product accessibility template. Um, and then when you're writing contracts, include accessibility uh, in those contracts. Um, for recruitment, if you're hiring someone, make sure you're asking about if, do they have knowledge about accessibility? Do they know what WCAG is? Have they ever used a screen reader before? Um, and then there's you know, ARIA is um, a coding language that they should be familiar with. Um, and then, you know, even better is if they're a, a certified professional in accessibility core competencies, which, which um, is something that uh, Joanne and I have bo are both certified in. Commit to hiring people with disabilities. That is yeah. so important. Yeah. Um, People really, it's really unfortunate how much people underestimate um, people with disabilities and they think that people can't do a certain job. Um, you can be a coder and have a visual impairment or be blind. Like it's really, um, so anyway, make a commitment to hiring people with disabilities um, and then make sure your online applications or whatever your application process is, is accessible to all people. Um, so now what? What can you do? So I would say today or right now, if you're finished, done listening to me, uh, ditch your mouse, try navigating a website, your own website or another website using just the tab and enter keys. If you want to go backwards, it's shift tab. I feel like most of you guys probably already know this, but maybe you've never actually tried um, to do that on your site. Um, May I make one recommendation? If you are using JAWS, I recommend turning off the screen and using the keyboard. That will change your experience as well. And you can do that on your iPhone. If you have an iPhone, VoiceOver is, is built in, so you can try that as well. Um, find a role-based training for your team. Uh, that's something that Perkins and I provide a lot. Um, I do a lot of role-based trainings, which is why I'm trying to jam a million things into this presentation, because usually these each role I talk about for three hours. Um, know your le legal obligations, be familiar with WCAG. Again, incorporate users with disabilities into your testing. Ask your third parties about what they're doing about accessibility. And become an accessibility champion. We really all have a responsibility um, to promote this in our organizations. Um, ask your leadership about it. Form an accessibility committee if one doesn't exist already. Um, there's a lot that you can do to really improve the experience for all users. Whew. Yeah, good job. I apologize <laughs> to our captionist because I know I went, I talked way too fast, but. Um, so do we have time for just a couple questions? Um, yes, so the question was about um, automated tools and um, you know, the benefits and which, because there's a lot of them out there, um, which ones are, are great. Um, I want to be careful about endorsing any of those tools, um, but I will say like a, a free one that you can quickly, there's a Chrome extension, you can run it on any site, is um, wave. It's either wave.org or wave.com, and you just plug in um, your URL. Um, that's produced by WebAIM, that's a great one. Um, there, there, there are a lot out there, but that's a, a really easy free one. Um, there's built-in accessibility into the Chrome developer um, tools as well. Um, so you definitely take advantage of those. Um, and again, I just I have to 
do the disclaimer that this catches like 20 at most 40%. So make sure you're still using manual testing. But yeah, absolutely, it's a great place to do a quick check on your site. In the balcony? So the question was about apps and where does sort of the burden lie in terms of making things accessible, whether it's with the device or the app developers. Um, and it's a little bit of both. Um, it's important that the device or platform is providing um, options and ways to make your apps accessible. Um, again, I could talk for hours about making apps accessible. Um, I know Apple has made a really big commitment to making things accessible, but you have to understand how to use their accessibility a API. Um, so that's important. You need to make sure, you know, apps rely heavily on icons, so you need to make sure that those have accessible labels that, you know, what it is, whether it's a button or a form field is communicated to the user. And then the API also lets you add hints, which, you know, just provides users with more information about um, how they should be interacting with that. Um, so again, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, both the device and, and the developer. Um, and then, you know, that's about native apps. And then with, with web, with um, responsive websites that you're looking on a, a mobile device, um, that's, a, I would say, more of, more of the responsibility. Not just on de the developer, I want to, that's, they're not responsible for everything. But um, anyway, this, the person, those who are working on the site, um, it's their responsibility to make sure that the responsive design is accessible and follows, WCAG would apply to that. Maybe one more question, I'm not getting the hook yet, so yes, in the middle. Can, so the question was where can you get feedback um, for what you put in your applications? Um, I, shameless pitch, this is us, these are all services that we provide at Perkins Access, so we do audits, manual testing, we do kind of like a quick um, a really quick high level check of your site. It's deeper than an automated test, but you know, just to give you a sense of where you are in, in terms of accessibility. Um, again, you know, th they're obvious we're not the only company that, or organization that does this, but I think we're the best, so. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's really important to know about accessibility in your own organization, but also work with a third party that has subject matter experts on that. And we definitely have user feedback, so that's a good thing. Yeah, a great service that we provide at Perkins is we, we also do user testing. So we do audits, assessments, um, trainings, and, and user testing. And I work with Joanne a lot, um, moderating those tests, doing things like going to a site and performing a simple task. So, you know, hospital site, can the user find a doctor? That's a very basic task that everyone needs to be able to do. And so I'll test with her, we'll identify the barriers. And that's so valuable because even um, as someone who tests against WCAG all the time, things are always gonna surface in a user test right. that um, I don't, that don't stand out to me because, you know, there's, is experience is different and I, you know, I can see that I have, a, I have a bias in how I'm interacting with things. So I think we're out of time. If you do have more questions, my email's on the screen, taylor.snook at perkins.org. Um, our Twitter handle, please, um, I will check that immediately for more questions. Um, and our website is perkinsaccess.org. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.